Hey Zwifters and welcome to the Zwiftcast and hello to Nathan Guerra, my regular compadre. Nathan, I missed you last time. How's that collarbone healing up? Hey Simon, we're doing pretty good here. Um, we're attached. Yeah, we've got an x-ray that came through and the two bones have connected. Uh, how many weeks out do you think? Uh, they said somewhere between like four to five from now, maybe even sooner, but we'd have to get another x-ray that week if I wanted to race. Yeah, so. yeah. There's one race that you're really targeting, one remaining race this season, isn't there? Uh, we found out that as far as like the series goes, I'm okay and I don't actually need to do it, but um, it would be fun to go and get that one race in. It's a really great race that I really like. I won it last year, would like to go back and repeat. So we'll see if I can make that happen. Okay. Well, later in the Zwiftcast, we're going to be hearing from Scotty Vice who uh, has also had a race he's been targeting for the last four or five years. And as many Zwifters will know, um, there was some pretty good news around that, but we'll get to that later. Um, now, my other partner in crime, Shane Miller, can't be with us this episode, but we've got the next best thing. No live llama, but we have recorded llama. Um, as regular listeners will know, Shane and I spent some time at Eurobike a couple of weeks ago. And while we were there, we checked out Zwift in virtual reality. Here's how Shane got on when he stepped into the immersive 360 3D world for the very first time. So Shane, they tell us what we're seeing. So they've got a, a, one of the new kickers on a really beautiful Canyon bike and we have Zwift with Oculus Rift. So Shane's going to jump on the bike and put the goggles on and start pedaling. I'm told it's as simple as that. It's going to be really interesting to get a reaction from Shane because I've seen this uh, and it is awesome. It's so difficult to explain. It's going to be really interesting to see if Shane is able to explain. Uh, Shane's putting the headset on. Looks to be a bit of a tight fit, a bit of adjustment going on. This is it. So what I want you to do, Shane, is yes. just, just get, like give me your instant gut reaction to what you're about to see. Okay. It's pretty special. As an Aussie, I really know how to swear, so I hope you've got the bleep button ready if this is good. All right, let's go into the, uh, the other world. I'll be back. <laughs> oh, oh, what? Oh, no. I think I was all about I've got. This is absolutely surreal, guys. This. Okay, anybody? Ah, oh, you know. I'm just about to go up to the Watopia start line. I've looked behind my shoulder and saw the big, um, the alien statues up on the hill. I'm coming past somebody now. This is just so natural. The, the looking around, looking sideways. I'm looking back at the blimp out to my left. I'm looking down. Oh. Shane's now looking down at his own feet. And when I did that, that, that was, this was the thing that kind of blew my mind. I can see what gear I'm in. And I'm looking down at my front derailleur. Oh going past the pier now I'm looking sort of sideways at the pier but the head movement there's no lag there's no lag at all I'm uh, the integration of this usually I've done a lot of VR stuff in the past when it first came along but this is now oh, someone just went past me I oh when people get near you, it feels like you're invading their personal space, doesn't I, it? I was going to slap that guy in the bum as he went past as a bit of a g'day, mate, but um, I can't catch him. Okay, now the elevation as well. The visuals of the elevation are real. The road is really pop. Okay, there's a very few wow things in this world. This It really is a wow moment, oh isn't it? My. This is one of those things where you're... You'll never ever be able to see what it's about unless you try it. I've ridden up Watopia Wall thousands of times. This is a first. And I feel like I can reach out and just touch the barriers on the side. This is giving me goosebumps. This is, this is phenomenal. And the great, oh. So I'm, uh, I'm with the Zwift guys who've been uh, helping people to get their heads around this all week at Eurobike. Is, um, is Shane's reaction that we're seeing there, is that a very typical one? Oh yeah, definitely. That's what we got all week so far. Basically, people are literally amazed um, from the VR. It's really nice piece of equipment and um, yeah, I personally think it's the future. 
ah, oh, I could live in this world. I think I have in the, lived in the virtual 3D world of this, but this is just something else. Okay, now here's something that's surreal as well. A blimp has just gone past and we're at the location where they actually make the Zeppelin. So I'm sure I'll take the VR glasses off and if a blimp goes past as well, a Zeppelin goes past, I don't know what's real. Now, Nathan, the American critic, I'm old enough to remember this, the American critic John Landau once said, I've seen the future of rock and roll and it is Bruce Springsteen. Um, have we seen the future of Zwift and is it virtual reality? I actually had, but prior to seeing these videos and these reactions, I hadn't really thought about virtual reality being like the future of Zwift. Um, but when I heard Shane's reaction, I mean, a couple of quotes that I could pull from that. I am coming past someone right now. Yeah. Uh, and like the recognition of others and then how you reacted to the recognition of self in there. Uh, and the, the main thing a lot of times we're talking about lately, it seems like the community and the community aspect and the social aspect being one of the main poles and how you're interacting with others and how the connection to the game is so strong then when you're actually entering the world in a virtual reality, the Oculus Rift-like environment, I think that that is a huge future for Zwift if we can do it or they can do it right. Yeah, I mean, the problem with talking about this story, and I've noticed it with some of the video coverage of it as well, is, you know, the, the reaction you see from people and hear from people who've tried this is just like, wow. But, but if you ask them to explain it or articulate it, it's incredibly difficult to do. Um, I mean, you know, the best way I can explain it and i think you've just touched on that is you are inside it you're not you're not looking on you are living within and and it is a, a an astonishing feeling but you know we are here talking about an exercise platform so as many people will realize immediately you know there's a couple of big downside problems uh, i mean one of them is sweat and heat yeah, I mean, they're going to have to lighten the gear somehow. I don't think that this uh, is really made for exercise yet in any way. And there's going to have to be a whole new version. I mean, that they're going to have to come out with to make it a reality uh, that will have to be geared towards people who are going to work out and do virtual reality. VR, this, they do say, don't they? I've seen VR coming and going for the last decade, and I'm sure you have too. But they do say that this time it's going to stick and it's it they really have got it right this time and this is only first generation equipment I, i'm sure it's going to evolve pretty quick don't you think oh definitely i see it all over the uh social medias continually there's starting to be some live streams that are really focused on the vr um i think that the integration between physical movement and figuring that out correctly and then how you are experiencing the game. I think those two have taken a long time to get right, but uh, it seems like we're starting to head in the direction where, you know, we're, they're starting to get it down. Yeah, Eric and the team at Zwift HQ have been hinting broadly, largely with a picture of like a hell of a lot of <laughs> Alienware PCs in a, in a warehouse somewhere, that they're taking Zwift out on the road this autumn or fall, as you guys say, and winter and um, uh, uh, really pushing the hands-on Zwift experience, which as we both know, and as probably everybody knows, is kind of the best way to sell uh, sell the platform. And, and it looks to me as though they're going to be including VR in these Zwift stations. I mean, I, I guess why wouldn't they? But but the other question is, why would they really? Because this isn't, you know, it's not going to be massively accessible to everybody because of price. And as we've already alluded to, it's not, you know, ideal yet for for, for, for exercise based things. Why, why do you think they would show it off? Just because they can yeah i would think there's a huge wow factor you're you know you're there experiencing it from the outside looking in and while you're on the trainer watching your avatar but then when you actually jump into it and look around in the world and see the other avatars and see the other people in there i think it actually gives somebody an immersive experience to say okay zwift is this cycling world that i can interact with and i think looking down the road and seeing what's coming people are more uh, apt to invest in that too, you know, yeah. because a trainer setup and all that 
that, it's a big, it's an investment, you know, and, and you're setting up this space for you to work out. And so I think that people then are like, well, we know that Zwift is committed to building this long term and I want to be a part, especially if this is the experience I'll get eventually too. Okay, well, that is all interesting stuff coming down the line. Um, but what's with us right now and where there's been a big development in the last few days is the Zwift Academy. Now, more than 100 women have spent all summer completing a rigorous programme of training and tests and assessments. And now 12 of those ladies have made it through to the next stage of the programme. Uh, and this, this programme, we, we need to remember, is aimed at identifying someone who has got what it takes to become a pro rider for the Canyon Shram team. So let's meet one of those semi-finalists. Welcome to the Zwiftcast to Rachel Elliott. Rachel, how you've managed to complete the academy workload whilst smashing PBs all summer in time trials is uh, a bit of a mystery to me. So what's your secret? Um, Well, it's a bit of a mystery to me as well. It was pretty tough to fit everything in. Um, I mean, I was racing two or three times a week every week um, and trying to fit in these pretty horrific training sessions was very difficult so it was um, sort of a matter of targeting races and doing hard training sessions the day before less important races um, and just trying to get my priorities right <laughs> but yeah. it was pretty tough well it's obviously worked out i mean you you know you have been streaking uh, over time trial courses this summer and now now you've got through to the academy so i'm going to ask you the traditional question uh, how did it feel when you got the news um i was very very pleased um I didn't expect to get in at all. There's some incredibly strong ladies there you see in all the group training rides. So I genuinely didn't expect to get through. Um, I knew I'd made an improvement across the summer. The training sessions had had really helped, but I I genuinely didn't think I'd get in. I think you're perhaps the only one who thinks that, Rachel. (laughs) Looking at looking at some of your times um, on 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 the outside stuff. Obviously, I've not seen much of you on on the academy. uh, how's the program been? Um, I mean, obviously, there's been like loads of, of sessions to complete, which I gather have been getting progressively harder. But it seems to me that one of the great things about it has been perhaps being part of the academy community. Is that right? Yes. I mean, it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I've never seen so many women cycling um, and um, so many women sort of cycling so well. Um, uh, I, I, I've never followed a training program like that in my life um, myself um, and some of the sessions were pretty tough um, but sort of the support of the ladies saying oh yes I found that tough too it, it really helped to get through it it was good to be able to chat to the ladies and we, all, we were all going through the same thing mm. um, and everyone found them equally as tough no matter what your power is they're equally as tough for everyone your heart rate's doing the same thing so um, I think it, I think it was great to be able to have all those ladies there to talk to it always helps, doesn't it, yes, when, when you're yes. doing something hard, to be doing something hard with, with, with a bunch of people. Yeah, exactly. um, so what's next? I mean, you know, Final 10, um, we, we mustn't forget that whilst this scheme uh, does foster this great community spirit and does get people doing hard work on virtual virtual riding and on trainers, it is actually a recruitment tool for a pro team. I mean, could you go all the way? Um, well, I guess that's... That, that, that depends on how I do in, in, in the final few months, but um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And um, there's some very, very talented ladies out there. I've, I've been stalking them all morning and seeing, seeing who else has got through. <laughs> um, there's, there's a few ladies who aren't there who I thought might be. So um, there's some pretty strong competition. So we'll just see how it, how it goes. And as they say, I'll, I'll enjoy the journey. <laughs> Yes, so you're already sounding like a professional sports person, Rachel. Well, I, I don't you know. know about it's that. like one day at a time, isn't it? We'll take <laughs> the next race as it comes. <laughs> um, and and it's just now a process of attrition, isn't it? The ten will get whittled down through yes. ever harder workouts and sessions. What do they get whittled down to next? Um, it's down to three, so that the, the final three get invited to the canyon sram training camp and then then it's whittled down to the final one so it's 10 then three then one gosh (laughs) and seriously you know be honest with me how do you rate your chances of of making the final three oh gosh i i I don't know i'll I'll see how it goes i mean i'm not racing 
um, my time trial season finishes in early October. So I'll have more sort of energy to put into the training sessions, but, but we'll just see how it goes. And I, I'm just pleased, pleased to get where I have and um, I'll, I'll just play it by ear for now and, and just see how I get on. Yeah. Well, many, many congratulations from me. It's been great to see you um, uh, doing so well outside as well as clearly doing very well inside. Very well done, Rachel, and lovely to talk to you again. Thank you very much and good luck to all the other ladies as well who've got through. Uh, Nathan, has Lindsay taken part in the Academy? Uh, Lindsay, her exact quote was, I only want to do something if I could do it all the way. And um, there just wasn't uh, really a, a time. And then eventually also she's like, I got the pro contract. I couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, you know, yeah, so yeah, it was yeah. like, it was like, why would I go after this? And she gets pretty focused and like, okay, I'm after this thing. Um, so I think that was the main reason why she didn't participate. Yeah, yeah, I can completely understand that. The more I've talked, and, and there's two other interviews on this podcast with, with semi-finalists, but the more I've talked to, to the women involved, the more impressed I've been about the, uh, about the whole Zwift Academy thing, and the more surprised I've become that Zwift are not shouting about it much louder. It's an amazing scheme. I'm I'm talking about it almost during every single uh, live stream of the races that I'm doing because there's always these ZA riders that are in there, always these women who are participating in our live stream races and I'm hyping it up and I think it's such an amazing program and I was like, yeah, Zwift hasn't really been shouting about it at all on the social medias or anything or all these other places. So I was also extremely surprised by that. I mean, I'm not exactly sure why that is. Well, I guess they're just being patient, aren't they? And patiently building a... uh, And I think, you know, we need probably to be honest about why they're doing this. I mean, I I think they're doing it because they genuinely believe they're doing a good thing and and supporting cycling. And and they've got a bit of a track record in that area. So it pays not to be too cynical. But I think one of the reasons they're doing it is because Zwift have identified female cyclists as a potentially enormous growth area and if they can patiently build a community of female cyclists that 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 looks to me as though you know if what they believe comes true is going to be a really great business decision yeah definitely okay so i can definitely see that and um they do have a really strong community building you see the za badges all over the place you see have you seen the new kit that they came out i mean they did promote that that's for sure the new kit that they came out with for the women uh who completed all the za workouts and that thing looks pretty slick actually and again just talking uh to the women you know again they have been and they were very honest with me they they said that the way that they have been you know really properly coached and properly looked after by I know Mike McCarthy's had a lot of involvement in it but by the people behind the programme has been like super impressive I mean you know Zwift are not playing around with this they're really doing it properly yeah, I actually interact uh, a whole bunch with one of the participants. Uh, I actually coach one of the participants, and they uh, had a training peak set up that had a whole bunch of workouts and direct interaction going on with some background coaching directly through the ZA program. All the workouts had a very clear layout. I mean, and looking at the workouts that they were given, they were high caliber. So, I mean, they did a very good job of supporting the entire program for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, kudos to Zwift for that and I, I actually hope that they do shout about it uh, a bit more because I think they deserve some recognition for it um, okay uh, next up I've got an interview with a guy called Andrew Tillin now Andrew writes for an American magazine called Outside that's a big mag in America isn't it Nathan yeah it's huge uh, like you see it it's almost like a household name as far as the magazines go amongst active lifestyles people yeah. so yeah, yeah it's huge yeah I mean less less familiar in Europe but but it is it is available online um, but possibly counterintuitively, given the title of the mag, Andrew's just done a long, long, in-depth piece on Zwift, and I wondered what he found out. Um, welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me, Simon. Let's plunge straight in. What did you discover? Well, I discovered a, a considerable amount of uh, passion for something that uh, I have historically loathed, which is indoor riding. 
Yeah, and of course, I mean, people should know you're a very decent cyclist yourself. You're an ex-racer and an, and a lifelong rider. And I guess as part of this assignment, you spent some time on Zwift. What, what have you personally made of it? Uh, I, I find it uh, appropriate and compelling and useful and actually fun in myriad ways. Yeah. How deeply did you immerse yourself in the subject? I mean, what, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to spoil the piece, but what were some of the kind of m more interesting things you found out? Well, I think, you know, you, you get on and um, the first thing you feel is, is utter cynicism. I mean, I'm, I'm like I say, you, like you said, you know, I've been riding my bike for a long time and I've been racing and indoor training and I can't stand riding the trainer and I don't care how many videos I have, movies, music um it's 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 it has never been compelling for me and so you get on this and you just sort of don't think it's going to be very fun and really i think i think the first time you know i had to to climb the the major hill in watopia and the kom the kom stuff uh, drops down there on the screen and suddenly you're a rat chasing the cheese i mean it's almost reflexive and i found myself sort of giddy and you know, trying really hard and laughing at myself that here I am, you know, alone in my living room, me, my bike, the trainer and a television and a computer. And I am killing it. I'm doing everything <laughs> I can. And, and so that's what I think when you sort of realize that this is um, compelling in a way that uh, its predecessors have not been. Yeah. So you started as a cynic. How quickly were you converted? Was it literally the first KOM? Um, you know, no, I, I don't think it was just that. Um, I think it was the notion that uh, you're not alone, even if you are alone physically, um, sort of intellectually, emotionally, because, um, you know, there's this stimulus in front of you. Again, you, you know, both both you're in the experience and you're having a little bit of an out of body experience, sort of standing apart from yourself, looking at it going, this can't be happening, that I'm actually participating in this sort of profound and engaged way. Um, but you find yourself riding with other people, happy to see other people, even if you're not riding with them, even if you're letting them pass you or you're passing others. Uh, there's just the feeling that you're, you're not out there. You're not in it alone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I mean, I've, I've seen some of outside Mag's coverage of Swift, obviously living in the UK, mainly online. And um, I mean, what you get on the kind of below the line comments stuff is, is, is probably what you'd expect, really, which is an awful lot of people saying, what the hell is Outside Magazine doing running a piece about people hunched over a computer game in a sweaty cellar, you know, a million miles away from the fresh air and the blue sky? Yeah. Uh, you know, and of course, that what that represents is is a school of thought that just says we should not be riding our bikes inside. Where where do you sit on that that in that position now, given what you've learned as part of this assignment? I think that's personal. I think if uh, I'm a I'm a 51 year old guy and I love to ride my bike still and I love to ride at what I think is a fast pace although when I ride with a 20 or 30 something I'm quickly reminded of my humble vintage but you uh, and me you and me both Andrew yeah let me yeah. tell you but but um if I were 20 or 30 something it would be like oh this guy isn't a purist he's a loser he's indoors um but there's a lot of ways to slice life and now that I've I've lived double of the life of a 25 year old you know, I've got kids, I've got work, I've got obligations. I mean, it's a huge victory for me to throw my bike, my leg over the the bike, you know, when it comes to um, being on the on the trainer and engaging in Zwift. And to me, that is a, it can be a glorious victory and a, and a, and a wonderful moment. And um, yes, it's not the wind in your hair. Um, and I'll, I will add that the internet is just full of trolls who just will make trouble wherever they can, yeah. wherever they can. Yeah. You got to just roll with it. Uh, so I would say that um, different strokes for different folks. And I think Eric, or like I say, you or I. I mean, we we would all probably prefer to be out riding um, under the blue sky on a sunny day. But if we can't have that. Boy, this is a this is an awfully uh, great alternative.
yeah yeah well that's a really interesting a really interesting view and, and particularly well articulated i think actually the other big piece on Zwift, and I know it's something that the Zwift execs and big cheeses think about an awful lot, is community. Um, you know, for Zwift to be successful, it's got, it's got to be underpinned, supported by, uh, and endorsed by an active community. What, what did you make of what you found out about the community? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think uh, I think the Zwift sort of ride calendar is in some ways the most impressive aspect for me to the whole endeavor i mean more as a rider sure like zwift academy i think that's really cool um and there are all there are other aspects i mean even this podcast right and this and nathan garrett race commentating i mean that's just more technology than i can wrap my head around in certain ways (laughs) but uh um, you know, you go to that calendar, and I did that early on. I did the Richmond group ride, even just sort of being among people, you know. So I'm from Austin, Texas. I mean, here's a rider from Israel. Here's a rider from Japan. Here's a, you know, and, and we all know what the other ones are doing in, in their kitchens and uh, hallways and living rooms. They're all doing what we're doing, and they're either suffering or sweating or enjoying themselves or all three of those things. And so I, I find that calendar and the group rides when I'm successful in really finding them and participating to be um, big achievements. Do you think Swift will permanently change cycling or is that like really a silly question? You know, is it just that we've got smart or Swift have got smart at finding, you know, just another way to ride your bike? Yeah, I... I would hope for the former and I think the latter. I mean, you know, this is a, there's a barrier of entry to cycling that's not just about the equipment. There is, you know, there are, there are stray dogs, there are oblivious pedestrians, there are texting uh, drivers, there is glass in the road, there is uh, you and the fact that maybe you don't look like, um, you know, a tour rider in your Lycra Um, there are all sorts of barriers to getting on a bicycle. And if this gets anybody who otherwise wouldn't to try to ride a bike, I mean, for all the reasons that so many of us ride, isn't that a good thing? Yeah. I I mean, I'm not trying to sound like a a Zwift poster child here because, um, you know, it's my job to sort of see both sides. And and yeah, I, I can miss the sunshine on a... 30 mile Zwift ride. But the the flip side is that I think you just, you you know, there are lots of people that are on Zwift that might not otherwise try riding a bike. And sometimes when you get in the group rides and you see the doctors and the dentists and the journalists and, you know, the school teachers who have spent disproportionate amounts of money on bicycle parts, you're just kind of like, well, what are we chasing here? Aren't we all here just to ride? And Zwift in a way allows you to do that. Mm, that's a really, really interesting viewpoint. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a very thoughtful piece. Um, it, it, it is both print and online, isn't it? Um, yes, it will be online uh, uh, third week of September. So um, it's, of course, uh, already out in print. It's the October issue. Well, I'm sure lots of Zwifters will uh, will be looking forward to reading it. And it's actually really uh, been absolutely fascinating hearing um, about your experiences with the platform, particularly given your background and, you know, given, given the job that you do. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew, for your time. Thank you, Simon. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, now, Nathan, Andrew obviously contacted you for that piece. Um, interesting, I think. He clearly set out a cynic and came away a convert. Yeah, when I first talked to him, he had so much surprise in his voice, actually. It was like, like every every other question was like, huh, what, whoa? And then he came and watched a live stream of the races. And then after that, he was like, all these questions in the chat. And then he was emailing me and then on the phone. I mean, it was like question after question. He's like, so you're actually talking to people like while you're riding through some sort of voice interaction. And I mean, it was like question after question. It was really great, actually. A big eye opener, you know? Um, and so I think that had something to do maybe a little bit with like loss of cynicism, you know, and like, okay, maybe outdoor and indoor can interact a whole bunch. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, that was a cool conversation with him. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, interesting, you know, the article is timed 
timed perfectly for Zwift. And and I get the sense that we're going to be seeing a big, big push this 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 fall and winter from Zwift. Um, uh, people who who watch the company's activities closely might have seen that they're hiring. They're looking to recruit a marketer, particularly for the North American market. Do you think we're going to see a massive push on Zwift in the next couple of months? Oh, I think it's going to be huge. I think that this especially this marketing position that's being opened up is going to connect them to the industry in some amazing ways. It sounds like they're looking for a very qualified person uh, in the bike industry and in the active lifestyle industry, etc. Throwing this out there in Outside Magazine, they start getting connected with gyms, bike shops. Uh, you know, there's going to be a big focus, I think, also with the push into the U.S. market. It's funny, most of my viewers or a lot of my viewers are from Europe. I got a huge contingency of uh, people from the U.K. and other countries over in Europe and and, uh, and then I, I mean, I think I look at my stats and it's like, I think the top is Great Britain and then the U.S. actually. And I think there's been more of a push over there actually a little bit. And I think we're going to see a whole big influx from the U.S. market actually this uh, this next, I think from every market. But I think they're starting to really focus over here now too. Yeah. Well, certainly the U.S. is a huge market. And I mean, do you think the Zwifters who are on the platform at the moment are all early adopters or, or do you think... It, it's already a mainstream product or is it about to become a mainstream product? Ooh, mainstream product. That is, uh, that's a loaded word. <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, yeah. a loaded, a loaded state, loaded statement there. Uh, because, um, I'm not even sure cycling's a mainstream product here yeah, in the yeah. US, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's, and we're working on that. We need to, remember, and I think Zwift is going to be more of a part of that too. But uh, I think in the cycling world, yes, I would definitely say that it's going to become a mainstream product. I hear at races, when I'm at the races over and over again, uh, how do I get involved in Zwift? How do I do this? What's going on with Zwift? And people are really starting to look forward to uh, how they're going to handle their training this winter. And it was something that was on their radar last year, but I think it's a little bit more where I've got shops asking how to do this. I've got, you know, and there's technologies they used to use that people are not as interested in. And they're like, this is the new thing. Let's try this. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, well, it's certainly going to be a very, very interesting upcoming season for the platform. Um, it sounds as though we're going to see a huge influx of new riders, which is going to be very exciting. OK, let's catch up with another semi-finalist from this terrific scheme we've been hearing about, the Zwift Academy. Uh, welcome to the podcast to Leah Thorvildsen, who is a... Academy semi-finalist and I'm going to ask you that most traditional of questions Leah how did it feel oh my gosh <laughs> it was you know waiting for that announcement was the longest I want to say about 48 hours of my life because it was just like going on every place that it could be posted and just refreshing and refreshing and refreshing. I started at one point looking at the hundred in just of names that I knew going like, Oh yeah, yeah. She's probably going to get in. And, <laughs> and after I got past about 10 women and I was just, I was just like, I, I've got to stop this. I've got to stop this because it's not going to do any good. So it was just so exciting. But then of course it's hard because a lot of the women that I had pegged as sure things didn't make it. And, and, you know, suddenly it's like you want to celebrate, but you feel bad for the people that have been, you know, they're going through the same thing you are and they didn't make it. And there's so many worthy people, you know, based on what I could see, which wasn't as much as the judges could see. But you kind of are sitting there going, it's this just complete exhilaration combined with, I don't want to say guilt, but it's just like, well, shoot. What, sympathy what I, sympathy what, maybe yeah, for the other yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so, but you got in and I know. You've, you've, you've only been cycling for a year. What the hell? <laughs> well, and I, I know it, it's, oh gosh, I just, um, you know, I, I um, honestly, I mean, when I think about it, I think as far as being a true professional, I have a better shot at cycling than I probably ever did with running, but running was my first thing. Um, that was kind of my, that was my first love. And, and I got close enough to being professionally competitive. I mean, I guess it was, I made some money, so I guess you could say technically I was professional, but I was never on a salary as a runner. It was just, you know, marathon winnings and such, but, um, it became your life. It really became my identity. And when I sustained some injuries that the doctor said, you know, you, I was just like, okay, well, how, how, how bad, how long is the recovery? What's the surgery? And they're like, you may 
not be able to run again. We're just talking about doing things to get you back to comfortably daily living. I just wanted something to do to be able to get back out and get back active and, and be surrounded by like-minded people, you know, and, and found this running or cycling community that was just as wonderful as the running community I'd been part of. So now it's just crazy. It's like something that I, I, I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> would, you, would you, listen, would you, would you like to be a pro cyclist? I mean, it looks to me, uh, what do I know? But, it, you know, it looks like you may have what it takes. Would you like to be a pro cyclist? Well, I mean, absolutely. Now, I will say <laughs> this. I don't, I will say this full and well. I think that, and someone made a comment about this on the Facebook page, and they said, I don't think half these women even like they're having these conversations and they don't even understand what it takes to truly be a pro. I was having, I had a, I had emailed someone at Zwift the other day and I was like, I'm just taking this one day at a time. But yeah. I said, but something that I need to know is if, um, if I were to be selected, is this a thing like, do, do you, is this something people do alongside their careers <laughs> or is this, and she's like, um, no, no. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I didn't, I did, I kind of didn't figure, but at the same time you don't, you don't know because with running it absolutely was, you know, it was weekends and you fit in the training around your job, but it was not. You know, it wasn't a full time job. And I don't know what 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 a contract pays an athlete. But but I do know that it's, you know, your life. I do understand the dedication that it takes to be a professional or an elite athlete, that it's just like some of the things that you do now where it's like, you know, oh, OK, I can I can have that extra beer. I can lose that extra two hours of sleep. I can you know, not watch my nutrition. And I tend to like pretty healthy food anyways, but it's just all those little things that you have to dial in. I would love, I, 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 it would be just a dream experience. It's, it's hard to fathom that, that I'm that good. <laughs> so I, I'm so excited. I'm so, so excited. I'm just, yes. <laughs> well, Bring it on. that is so great to talk to somebody who is so excited about, you know, the possibility of being a pro cyclist. And just finally, in a few words, has this been a good program? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, you asked me for a few words, and I'm sure you've already realized I'm, I can get really long-winded when I talk about something <laughs> I'm excited about. But um, I just didn't um, – before the academy started, I was training probably 30 to 40 miles every morning on Zwift. And I literally – I jumped into a few of the group rides, but otherwise it's like I literally I just got on and I wrote. I didn't have a clue, so it's been – just really cool to be able to see some of that stuff and then to talk to people on in real life rides and apply some of the things that I've learned from the academy it's just been a tremendous experience and I would recommend absolutely anybody that's on Zwift even if they don't think you know that they have any chance of ever being pro just to go through the experience anyways because it's it's just so wonderful. And the, the sense of community and other people that you meet has been really, really fun, too. I have so many virtual friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Swift, Swift is, is good like that. Thank you yeah. so much indeed for talking to me. It's just oh, great. It's you. great to hear someone who is so enthusiastic <laughs> and excited. And uh, Thanks, Simon. The- I appreciate it. Now, winter's coming. We don't dread it quite as much as we used to in a post-Zwift world. And lots of people will be thinking about trainers. Should I buy a new one? Should I upgrade the trainer I've already got? What's on the market? Um, We covered quite a lot of that in the last episode. And if you didn't catch it, it's well worth a listen. Um, And we did it with DC Rainmaker, the revered tech reviewer. Um, Ray was incredibly generous with his time and in the last part of the time I had with him he allowed me to put him on the spot and to fire a series of questions to him about his personal favourite trainers Um, and this is also worth a listen to. Okay, Ray, you're going to buy a high-end trainer, Neo, Drivo or Hammer? Neo. The mid to high-end bracket, which I'm thinking is Kicker or Flux, which would you go with, Ray? 
So that's really tricky. Um, if you had to buy a trainer this second today, then in that mid to high end, so I categorize that as basically $800 to $1,200 is the best way to kind of categorize. Anyway, so mid and high end, I would say if you had to buy today, a kicker too. But if you can wait a few months to see what happens, the Flux could definitely be the one there. It's going to purely come down to accuracy. Um, you know, I was talking with folks uh, in the industry, in the trainer industry, uh, two nights ago, and everyone's incredibly nervous. Uh, they they would look at the Flux 2 as a nuclear option, where basically, or not Flux 2, the, uh, the Flux is a nuclear option in the trainer in that particular $800 to, you know, $1,200 range. And if, if tax can one ship it, and if they can go ahead and make it accurate, it's game over. Like that's, that is a kicker killer. End of story, just box it up and call it done. Um, if, however, they struggle to, to do both of those things, then yeah, Wahoo's going to continue to do well. Okay, next, wheel off trainer. Uh, just to clarify, wheel off or wheel on? Uh, sorry, we're, uh, wheel on. Uh, and not at the very bottom of the market. So I suppose we're talking around about the kind of kicker snap area. What's your, what would be your trainer of choice there, Ray? Okay, um, I, so it's a really interesting spot. I don't want to, I want to say to some degree, a lot of those end up being about the same, um, to be honest. I think that's becoming a very crowded market, which is awesome for consumers. And that, you know, five to $600 range um, where you've got kicker snap, you've got uh, Vortex, you've got Bushido, you've got um, Rampa from Elite, you've got uh, Magnus from uh, from Cyclops and Be Cool, and I'm probably forgetting some. Um, they're very, very similar. I think what people want to focus on is sort of really two areas uh, when they're trying to decide in that market is one, um, if you have some sort of upper level resistance requirement that you want, um, either in terms of wattage, which isn't usually the problem, but incline. Um, so if you're one that like loves to go and ride, re-ride Alpe d'Huez every week, um, then you want to pay attention to that. For a lot of people, that may not actually matter that much. And 10% for a lot of those will be fine. Um, but there's a couple, I think, that are at like 12.5 and 15%. So you may want to keep that in mind. Uh, two, accuracy. Most of them are all, honestly, five plus or minus 5%. Um, I'm seeing really good stuff with the Cyclops um, Magnus prototype that I have uh, being a bit more accurate than the 5% they're claiming. Uh, so that's something that, you know, that could be a very appealing trainer. Um, I like some of the nuances they've done on, on design and style of that trainer in terms of how you lock in the the um, uh, the roller resistance wheel, make it uh, a bit harder to screw up, to be honest, uh, and it's easier to calibrate. So to me, it's going to be nuances that decide that category. And I think a lot of that's going to be personal choice. <laughs> It is a very crowded area, that one. What, what, what's your personal favorite? I, you know, I am leaning right now. I want to see a production unit of Magnus, but I think um, if a production unit of Magnus is as clean as the early summer prototype I have, um, I think that may take that category um, just barely. Uh, at the same time, like Tax has options that are a couple hundred dollars cheaper that are really just as good. Um, that again, it really depends on market and where you are. Like in Europe, you can get tax trainers super cheap because of the way the, the pricing systems work. So those for that cost you know if i was buying in europe i'd probably say yeah i just go with the vortex um because you're going to save two or three hundred bucks and the nuances aren't that big a deal to me mm -hmm. just to kind of give people like an insight behind the industry and how this works a little bit um you know obviously elite and uh, tax are european based and so when you buy a trainer in the u.s you have something called a map or minimum advertised price um, or buy a lot of products in the u.s could be a gopro could be a garment could be a trainer could be dishwasher it doesn't really matter um the u.s is one of the few countries in the world that uh, allows is a company to enforce pricing and cut uh, retailers off um, if they price below something. So that's why you always see, you know, the GoPro at three ninety nine, not three ninety eight, not three ninety seven, or any other price. Is because if they go below that, then GoPro comes along and says, okay, you don't get to sell anymore, and that's legal in Europe. That's highly legal. Um, and in fact, even if a tax or elite were to hint at a retailer um, to to change their prices, they'll get fined twenty percent of their net sales for the year, um, which is a massive, massive fine. So that doesn't happen. The result of that, why this whole discussion actually matters, is that um, you'll find companies in Europe that are willing to sell trainers to the US and to other markets at much reduced prices. You know, that's great until something goes wrong. Um, and if you want a fun, like, science experiment, go ahead and uh, go online uh, to FedEx or UPS or even the US postal system or whatever your postal system is in your country and put the shipping cost for a 50 pound object that is the same size uh, back 
back to Europe. And that's what you'll have to pay twice, because then you have to pay to return it again. Um, which, and for some people, that risk is worth it. I'm not like saying go and buy in the US, not at all. I'm making people aware of that risk because I've heard the sob stories on, on the blog and comments where people have bought something from a European retailer um, shipped it to the U.S. because it was free and it was a great deal, and then something broke, and they end up paying more than their trainer was worth back and forth to get it back again. And you feel really bad, and you just kind of want to want people to be aware of that. And for some things, it may be worth the risk, you know. So you look at some trainers and go, "It's a well-made trainer, and I think it's going to be fine. Uh, I'm good with that." But again, just be aware of that risk. It must be really tough for Americans, as as Ray pointed out, deciding whether or not to take the risk. You know, do you take the risk of buying? from the EU where you're going to get a, a cheaper price and sometimes a much cheaper price. But if things go wrong, it's an absolute world of pain. I would never do it. Personally, I would never do it just because of that risk. I mean, uh, things break all the time unless you're really good at handyman and you think you can handle it and get the parts from them and then work on your own equipment. But uh, I, uh, that, that's a, that sounds like a huge risk. And personally, I mean, for me, I would... Uh, buy something locally here uh, in the U.S. on this side, at least, uh, in order to support that company. And uh, if I believe in their product, then I'll put a few extra dollars into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you Americans tend to be a little bit more sentimental about this. That, that, you know, <laughs> I, seriously, I think Europeans are just, you know, because we, we, we're in this kind of brutally competitive pricing environment, you know, we have no loyalty, Europeans, when we buy things. Apart, obviously, you know, you see lots of stuff about support your local bike shop. And, and people do try to support their local bike shop. But again, you know, local bike shops are getting killed by by online pricing. Um, I think you're further ahead than us on the global market thing. I think there's definitely that to it. So you just have a lot more going on between borders, I think, and people can undercut any way, which way they want. It's just unmanageable. I think here in the U.S. that there's things in place to make it manageable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether that, that, that more kind of brutally competitive pricing spreads to the U.S. Um, I've seen that, what he talked about over and over again, though, the same thing with the shipping. I mean, how many times have we seen that where somebody bought something overseas and then it's like, it's just worth nothing to me now because I got to pay double the price for it. I might as well go buy a new trainer here. So Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, well, um, it's probably trainer buying season and I'm sure that the uh, next couple of episodes of the podcast are going to be returning to that ever popular area um now the list of riders winning races after training and preparing on swift seems to keep on growing and the latest is a guy that keen swifters will know very well indeed he goes by the name of scotty weiss I, I hate to use this word, but you're a Zwift celebrity, Scotty. Really. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for that. I, I don't think I would call myself a celebrity, but I, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, listen, in, in, in the traditional sense of the word, celeb celebrity, you're very well known on Zwift. And that's because you've been there right from the beginning and have been incredibly prominent and really, really helpful to lots of people who are new to the platform. And, and you still appear very frequently on Zwift. But the reason I've got you on is to talk about something that's just happened over this summer in Austria and that is you winning handsomely two really really impressive races so well let's start by why don't you tell us what the event was the world master cycling F federation the world championships basically and uh, is that as important as it sounds to be, Scotty? I think it's very important. It's an event that's been going on for 40 plus years. And I thought one day I would like to go there and give it a shot. Worked out this year uh, in a big way, actually. Well, it certainly did work out in a big way because you, uh, you didn't win just one event. You won two. So talk us through the first one, which was the time trial event. Right. So the time trial... Um, you know, I'm a smaller, uh, smaller guy. I, I weigh around 117 pounds, uh, give or take, um, five six. So, the time trial for me has always been, you know, it's it's, it's tough for a small guy to. Pr produce the power that you need. Just because Zwifters are, are completely fascinated by numbers, what's your FTP? Uh, my FTP is somewhere around 309 to 320, depending on like when I, you know, give it a test. 
Yeah. And I mean, that's not a big power output for time trialists, is it? I don't think it is, no. Um, the key for me is to be really uh, super aero uh, in, in, in the you know, real world racing. In Zwift, I know it's, it's not quite as important, so you, you know, the power number makes a big difference. But in, in real world racing, the time trial, you have to be, if, if you have a lower number, you have to be, do whatever you can to be fast. So yeah. Yeah. that was uh, my strategy. And and uh, how long a time trial was it? It was twenty k, right? And what was your time? Uh, my time was twenty five minutes, I believe. Wow! And in old fashioned money, do you know what average miles per hour that was? Uh, yes, it was twenty nine point five. Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, I was. It was one of the better TTs I've had. Um, I was totally uh, building for you know the event this year and I worked uh, hours and hours and hours on Zwift actually riding not only on the trainer on my TT bike but also on the rollers on my TT bike using Zwift and uh, watching power numbers and heart rate and cadence and, and, and dialing in your position, your aero position. For sure, for yeah, sure. I, yeah. I actually did change my position this year based on what I saw. Uh, my numbers, you know, like riding Zwift, you can pay attention to your numbers. And, you know, I saw that maybe I wasn't in the quite the, the position I needed to be to produce the power. And I, and I, you know, I messed around with the position and actually raised, you know, raised my power a bit uh, in game. And, and then, you know, in the real world, it actually transferred over. Yeah. Oh, and that's a really interesting aspect of being able to rehearse a time trial position indoors, isn't it? Because the thing is, you've got fewer distractions. So you can actually change your position and tweak it and, and, and see what that does to the numbers, not in terms of how you're cutting through the air, maybe, but in terms of how you're able to produce power in a, in a new and different position. Exactly. And that was that was what I was focused on, not so much being aero uh, when I w was riding Zwift, but I was looking more at the comfort level and the power and the cadence. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if I could dial that in, then I knew working on being a little more aero outside, we could bring it together and, and you know, m make, it, make it happen. Uh, and that you did. Uh, but, th you know, and on that, just enormous congratulations. And there was a, 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 wells, a wellspring of, 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 of good feeling from the Swift community when they saw that. But then it got better and better and better because two days later, you entered the road race. And uh, guess what? You came first yep. there too. Um, so talk us through that. How, how long was the event? Well, so the road race was 112K. Um, it, it was three laps of a circuit that included, um, I think about a one mile or so climb uh, and then another short climb. And, and, and anybody who has been anywhere near you on Zwift, of course, knows that as soon as the road goes up, uh, you, we don't see you for dust. <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, I've always been looked at as, a, as a, more of a climber just because of my size. Um, and, and just talk us briefly through the final of the road race. Were you out on your own or...? Um, some very strong guys came up to me uh, and we formed a break of four guys. Uh, one one of the guys in particular, former World Masters champion as well. So I knew I actually knew two of the guys in the move, and so we we worked together and we put five minutes on the field, and that's when I started to get a bit worried because you know the finish was a flat, basically uh, it was going to be a sprint. Uh, so I started thinking, you know, what am I going to do? You know, thanks to Zwift, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I was doing those sprint workouts, working on sprinting on the rollers out of the saddle um, and then transferring that over into real life. So I was super confident that I could win the sprint. And so I jumped the guys. I jumped them hard at 500 meters and and I, I never looked back. It must have been great feeling oh my goodness it was almost uh, like a dream like I, I couldn't believe it i mean i, I, I th that was my fourth attempt at worlds 
and I knew I could always do it. And um, a lot of people believed in me, and I think I, I honestly started believing it more than ever in myself, and and, and I got it done. And I'm I'm really really happy, and I want to thank everybody that's sent me you know uh, the messages and emails and uh, the kudos on Strava. It's 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 been amazing. Yeah, yeah, and and the marketing guys at Zwift are very fond of this phrase, you know, Zwift today, win tomorrow. But oh, you know, sure. uh, there's a bit of truth there, isn't there? There there really there really is. Um, I, I really did focus on on a goal four years ago when I uh, retired, but since Zwift has come along these last two, I've actually increased almost e- every part of my you know cycling uh, skill. Uh, I know it's indoors, but a lot of times I ride rollers, and yeah. so you know when you're sprinting on rollers against you know a group of fifty guys in Zwift, uh, it, you know sometimes you lose your balance, and uh, it's 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 it, it builds on on your balance and your power i mean it's it's great i can't yeah. say enough about it yeah yeah now well um you're living proof that that it works and uh, you know on behalf of uh, i'm sure literally hundreds you know probably thousands of swifters who've who've seen you on the island and elsewhere uh, i'd just like to say congratulations and fantastic and really really well done thank you very much and and i really appreciate uh you having me on on the show i listen to your podcast all the time i mean i think it's great so thank you that's very kind of you to say scotty thanks very much indeed nathan uh, scotty wise i mean you know him so well don't you he, because he's just on the front of just about every swift race he enters isn't he yeah uh, actually the way that i know him is from beta originally when i first got in he was one of the first guys to come into my live streams while i was riding he's one of the first guys i would ride with and actually Lately, we've been doing a little reminiscing in the live stream where I'll bring up pictures of me, him, and Lawson Craddock doing intervals together out on uh, Jarvis, actually. I got all these, you know, F10s saved, right? Push F10 and grab all these pics and these large groups with Jonathan Pate and me, Lawson Craddock, and and uh, Scotty Weiss. And, you know, and we're all hammering on each other on the little three-mile island. And uh, I, so I've known Scotty a long time. He's actually... Almost every time I go live, he jumps into a live stream with us. So we chat uh, pretty often, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's a he's a he's a big figure in Swift, and I'm sure, you know. Uh, well, it, it was obvious on on Facebook just how popular his um, his winning that race was, and it was really great to hear him talk about it. Um, now, racing, uh, it's been strong over summer, stronger than I suspected it might be. That bodes well for the upcoming indoor season, doesn't it? Do you think we're going to see racing just getting bigger and bigger and bigger? So this has been a hot topic the last couple of streams. And man, that we had 129 people on Tuesday. Wow. On, in, the, in summer, yeah. like 129 <laughs> showed up. And right before that, we had like 70 or 80 in the ZTR race right before. So in the KISS race is the larger races right now. And then the ZTR race right before, we're talking over 200 racers showed up in the span of like two hours. Uh, and so during the winter, our largest race was around 100. Last uh, January or March, right? Somewhere in January and March area, we had somewhere around 100 racers show up, maybe. And so we're bettering those numbers in summer. We've got predictions. I mean, we're thinking we're going to have 300 racers show up. We're thinking we're going to have online. We had what, max of almost 1,500 on course. That's got to be at least. I'm thinking double, tripled, maybe even more. Really, um, really. I, oh, I would, I would think so. I mean, just because of the, uh, the excitement that's around right now. How many people who are talking about getting a Zwift? How many people who are outside right now are going to go inside and they're yeah. going to need something to keep them motivated? I think in all the results, Maddie Heyman, Scotty Weiss. I mean, the results. I think is the thing that's really going to drive the hardcores, and then that's going to tell and all their friends about it, you know. And they're going to be watching. Well, how am I going to get faster? And this is something that people are using. The thing that has changed since the racing went onto the modules, of course, is the starts. You know, the and I use the word in inverted commas. The neutralized start um, is no more, and every race now is that manic, you know, kick off full gas right from the flag cyclocross style race start it doesn't suit everybody i I have to say i don't like it that much i much prefer the old neutralized particularly when they were properly observed do you think that 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 style start is going to remain 
all through the next indoor season? Or do you think Zwift are working on a way of giving a, giving us the option of having a uh, a regulated neutralized start? I see three options uh, here. You could have a lead out car as an option yeah. that you could select, right? Yeah. So then you have yeah. this car that kind of leads it out and then all of a sudden, boom, let's go. I think uh, you just leave it as it is. That's another option <laughs> where not, nothing's going to change. And um, I, I don't necessarily have too much of a problem with that, but there's a third option where is you have a staggered start for the categories that we used to implement prior to the event module. But now it would be more controlled where you give about a one minute between each A, B, C, and D category, which would then cause it so that people who are uh, in the B race would not be able to hang on with the A's at the crazy pace that they're setting right from the get-go. I think it would kind of even things out and the people who did try and go super hard right from the get-go like that would not get as much benefit from it as they are getting in the lower categories that are trying to go with the leaders at this point. Yeah, uh, That was a huge hot topic actually in today's stream. Uh, lots of opinions were thrown around about it actually. And uh, there was a, a bunch of different options that were thrown out there. I think that Zwift's paying attention and will most likely start listening to some of the feedback being given. We'll see though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I think it will develop over over the indoor season. And, and I'm really looking forward to the, you know, the indoor racing season. I think it's going to be great this year. Um, now let's hear from our final uh, Zwift Academy Graduates, uh, another one of the ladies who's made it through to the shortlist of 12 riders. Belle Flint, who, like Richie Port, comes from Tasmania. Um, before you started this, how experienced or otherwise were you as a cyclist? What, what, what briefly is your cycling history? Uh, I took up cycling a bit over three years ago. I was a marathon runner before that, had an operation, couldn't, couldn't get back to running in a hurry and was told I could ride a bike. So I jumped on the bike and went from there. So you obviously had a pretty good aerobic base. You came into it quite fit. I, I did, yes. And what happens next? Well, I don't know. It's all a bit of a surprise. We get some more information. The next part starts um, on the 19th of this month. So there's another three months of training now. And um, I know they're going to give out um, information to the, the semi-finalists with rides that include, obviously, um, kicker rides, um, outdoor training rides, um, more variety. I think they're saying that there'll be six rides a week. Um, and obviously, it's up to the semi-finalists to, to do as many of those as, as they want to and as they can, I guess. And have you got the motivation to carry on? Because it's going to get harder. It is going to get harder, but that's really exciting too. Um, the challenge to see, you know, how far, how much can you improve? How far can you push yourself? Because, you know, the, even just the last three months, I've found myself doing things that I didn't know I could do. So that's really exciting in itself. And why did you enter? What, what, what was your ambition in entering? Where, where did you see this journey finishing if you were successful? I didn't even consider that I would be successful. I had a crash off my bike in May and split my nose open. Um, and it's been really sensitive and it's winter time here in Tassie. So I haven't been able to go out and ride in the cold like I normally would through winter. So I just saw it as three months of training that would just keep me motivated and on the bike when I couldn't actually get out in the cold air. Yeah. And that's as far as, as far forward as I looked. I mean, you know, say you made it to the end. Oh, as I said, it was. I never anticipated that I would have what they wanted. So it's look. If I make it to the end, then oh, I'll be even more surprised than I am that I've made it this far. <laughs> Obviously, um, if you did make it to the end, maybe some plans might have to change. Who knows? <laughs> yes, quite possibly. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, could you see yourself as a pro rider? Who knows? I mean, I was talking to my daughter about this this morning. Four years ago, I didn't even ride a bike. So, you know, anything's possible, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a great scheme. And, um, what you know, what's your, been your experience on it? One of, one of the great things about Swift is the kind of way that you become part of a community. And you've become probably, I would imagine, part of a couple of communities, probably the the female community and the really, really good riders of, 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 of that community. Have you noticed that? Uh, it's a very... 
it sounds funny because we're from all around the world, but it feels like a tight knit community. You know, you get on and you have a ride, and people are chatting while they're online, and you know, you're all in different time zones and different parts of the world, but you've all got something in common, and and everybody's chatting and urging each other along. And you know, when the sessions were getting really hard in that third month, you'd get on to the Zwift Academy um, Facebook stuff, and you'd see people encouraging each other and saying how tough it was, but how proud of themselves that they got through it, and just the encouragement that all the women were giving each other. You know, that's that's got to be the, the biggest benefit of being in something like this. I, I imagine that's been worth it alone, actually, hasn't it? Absolutely. And how have your family reacted to mum becoming a kind of <laughs> fairly committed virtual cyclist? Um, look, we're all cyclists, so it's um, a bit of a competition for the kicker at our house and it's got to be time to <laughs> in. So, um, no, they're, they're super excited. My daughter had said to me all the way through, are you going to get in, mum? Are you going to get in? And I'm like, no, no, it's not going to happen. So I got a big I told you so today. So <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> uh, and, and I've kind of, I mean, it's such a cliched question. Question, but I've got to ask it. How did you feel when you got the news? <laughs> I was very grateful that there wasn't, um, that the email didn't have video recording attached to it because, you know, a 40 year old jumping up and down excited probably isn't what the world needs to see. <laughs> Thanks very much, Belle. It's been lovely no to talk to you. Thanks for having me. And that's it for this episode of the Zwiftcast. Thanks very much indeed for listening. Thank you, Nathan. Have you got any other business to tidy up just before we go? We should remind people about the stream. Uh, yeah, just thank you so much for having me on. I always appreciate it. Hello to all the Zwifters out there. Always love to chat to you guys. And uh, we are live now on beam.pro slash Nathan Guerra. We are still live on Twitch and YouTube as well, but our main focus is on Beam right now. Uh, everybody's really liking that platform with the immediacy of the stream. It's only like a one or two second delay. So come check us out. We're having lots of fun racing. Nathan, uh, lovely to chat to you as always. And I look forward to catching up with you again very very soon. And that's it for this episode, Zwifters. Hope you enjoyed it. It just remains for me to say, as ever, thank you very much to Zwift for their generous support. And to remind listeners that um, even though I'm very grateful for that support, it doesn't influence anything we say on the podcast. Thanks, Zwifters. See you next time.